Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Dr. Felicia Knoll of the University of Miami and our esteemed panel. So I want to again thank Concordia for choosing the University of Miami as the sede for this amazing summit, and yet again for their uh, commitment, your commitment, to the issue of cancer and to the issue of women's health and to realizing how much we can do from this kind of platform, these sets of issues on equity, on gender, and the day after International Women's Day, a very particularly important panel. Um, I'm thrilled. Um, as the director of the Institute for Advanced Study of the Americas at our university and a member of our Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center and our Miller School of Medicine, but also as the president of a Mexican NGO, Tomate Lopecho, and one who lives herself with breast cancer, to be able to be with two very close colleagues and friends. We work together actually quite a bit. We were saying we always wanted to have this opportunity to be able to talk like this. Um, we should do this naturally, but it's wonderful that Concordia has made it possible. Dr. Aaron Kobitz, who's professor of medicine and public health sciences and our vice provost for research at the University of Miami, and Dr. Sophia George, who's associate professor at our University of Miami. And uh, somehow between the three of us, we, we cover breast cancer, we cover cervical and gynecological cancers, and we sort of cover the Americas, um, including South Florida, of course, but also the Caribbean and Latin America. And so uh, we're thrilled to be able to share more with you because I brought just a few statistics thinking more from the Latin America um, space that you know, still surprise me, frighten me, scare me, and inspire me to do more, which is that today breast cancer is, according to the statistics from GlobalCan, the number one cause of death in premenopausal women in our region in Latin America. Cervical cancer is the third leading cause. So we're talking about premenopausal younger women. And although it's a disease, a set of diseases, in particular breast cancer, that is in fact much more common in high income countries, the issue that we have to face, and we're gonna talk about more in this panel, is that when you think about equity issues, and particularly the ratio of mortality to incidence, or the probability that a woman will survive one of these diseases, it shouldn't, but it is highly correlated with where she lives and where she was born. If you get breast cancer in one of the lowest income countries in our region, you're about twice as likely to die from the disease as if you were in Chile, Panama, or Paraguay, still categorized as high income countries in our region. Um, and if you think about early detection, which is key to reduce the suffering that women and the costs of our health systems face, we have a huge problem of late detection in our region despite much earlier age at onset. And that, the statistics we have, it's about one in five women late detected in stage three or four in the United States, um, compared to between a third and closer to a half of women elsewhere in the region. The expectation that we have to have with cervical cancer is to see less and less of the disease. We know how to prevent it. It is becoming every day, I think, more and more a disease of poor women that attacks poor women, that kills poor women. Breast cancer, we're actually assuming and should see more of it as uh, countries develop, as incomes increase, and as, which is a good thing, um, women survive childbirth and survive into later years in life. What we should be looking for is the kind of reduction in mortality that we've seen throughout the high income world. But even in the United States, and this is where I'm gonna to start to turn it over to each of you, even in the United States, um, breast cancer incidence and death rates, and the same with cervical, differ substantially by race and by ethnicity. And so we wanna talk a little bit about how does ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and immigration status impact the development and survival rates of both breast and gynecological cancers in women. And we're thinking, I think, a lot initially about South Florida. Erin, do you want to start? Sure. So the etiology of cancer is extraordinarily complex, and the same is true for disparities in cancer outcomes. When we talk about diseases like breast and cervical cancer, particularly in underrepresented women, 
Much like Felice suggested, the diagnosis often occurs at later stages when the prognosis for survival is extraordinarily poor given limited treatment efficacy. The reason we see this later stage diagnosis is similarly multi-level in orientation. It reflects the influence of social determinants of health that create real constraints to women's ability to access cancer prevention and early detection. Most of my work has been in the context of cervical cancer, both in the Haitian diaspora community here in South Florida and in Haiti. And when we talk about cervical cancer prevention within the Haitian community, it's challenged not just by the lack of availability of care, but sociocultural perceptions of the efficacy of that care and whether in fact it serves women in ways that's culturally consonant with their ideas about health and disease prevention. And so what we've been challenged to do at the University of Miami, given the multicultural diversity of South Florida, is to really identify novel strategies for cervical cancer prevention that invite participation of diverse women and allow them to engage in primary and secondary prevention in ways that are suitable and sustainable. And Sophia, I have the privilege of working very closely with her for a long time. She is, in fact, my recruit, which I'm very proud of. Um, she can talk a little bit about how the work that we've been doing in South Florida has transcended to a broader Caribbean context and how some of the lessons we learn here in South Florida allow us to model um, inter evidence-based interventions for elsewhere. Sure. So um, as Erin indicated, some of the work that I've been doing, and I will talk about breast cancer and, and ovarian cancer. So um, in South Florida, many years ago, we noticed that women from the Bahamas uh, had early age at onset, very aggressive breast cancer. And so working with our collaborators and colleagues in the Caribbean, we looked at the genetics of breast cancer in, um, in that country. And what we've been able to do since then is to look at genetics related to breast cancer, not necessarily about ethnicity, but of course we can use ethnicity as country of origin and nativity. And what we see is that there is a variety of breast cancers across the um, Caribbean, and of course that's in America. And what we've been able to do is to implement screening programs, work with our colleagues in, in the region to implement screening programs, implement best practice, actually also implement and initiate fellowship programs there whereby um, faculty members and doctors from the Caribbean come to UM, learn our best practices, and then of course teach us their experience, experiences because we see the patients here too, and go back home and um, implement um, really great standard of care to be able to increase the lives of, um, improve the lives of women diagnosed with breast and ovarian cancer. In the context of like immigration, we've looked at using Florida uh, data, cancer data system, and we see something very interesting. So there is this immigrant paradox where we see differences in, uh, in individuals who are diagnosed with breast cancer, diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and endometrial cancer, and that they have different outcomes. It's, Unfortunately, when we look at black women who are diagnosed with breast cancer and endometrial cancer who were born in the US compared to women who were born in Latin America, in particular the black Hispanic population, the white Hispanic population, and also just Afro-Caribbean women, we see that they have a better outcome. And so there are questions that we're asking about the intersection of genetics of ethnicity and access to care um, that we are excited about and of course we continue to work collaboratively with our colleagues in, in, in the diaspora. So we're talking about high at-risk women, mm -hmm. but we also know the way that risk is distributed across populations differs. So can we speak a little bit about how can we apply our research to be able to better reach those at-risk populations, and particularly in context, and you know, we're blessed, this is not the context of the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, where we have access to an amazing number of resources and, and high-powered um, technology and the best physicians and nurses that we can think of um, in the country and probably in some cases in the world. Um, that's not the context we're talking about for many of these populations. So can we think about research that can help us to reach those at-risk women and bring them in earlier. So, Sophia, you and I are kindred spirits in that we very much believe in the power and necessity of community engagement. 
You can't do research in diverse communities, particularly those communities have, who have been historically disenfranchised from the formal healthcare system and research opportunity without inviting them to be a meaningful part of the research process, to both help conceptualize the focus of study, to be meaningfully involved in designing the methodology and data collection strategies, and then ultimately disseminating the findings so that they can lead to sustainable, meaningful change. A big part of the work that we do, both here in the United States and elsewhere throughout the region, is very much grounded in the tenets of community-based participatory research and the idea that we as scientists have an opportunity and obligation to bridge the chasm between the researcher and researched and to invite individuals whose voices have been, who have been historically muted, both in science and conceptualizing effective healthcare strategies to the table to work alongside us to develop the focus of research and then the inherent solutions that come from it. And let me just give a, a concrete example of what we saw with Tomate Lo Pecho in Mexico, which was when we looked at all of the educational tools that we had, the flip charts, um, the pamphlets, everything at our disposal, and I was sitting with wonderfully beautiful, brown, um, larger women all over Mexico, and each photograph, each person in that pamphlet was pink, 25 years old, and size 32A. And the way that they looked at me was, this is a disease that has nothing to do with the kind of woman I am, which was exactly driving the sort of myths um, that were behind their not reaching care in time. And so I think it's, it's very much about how we also design our, our tools to reach them. So if anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so you know, in addition to what Aaron said and what you said, it, also talking to the advocates, the, the people who have been impacted by the disease, and asking them in our research, you know, what it is that we need to do in order to one, um, help you do better with your care. Um, we talk about social needs and, and something that we don't pay atten enough attention to that we know now impacts overall survival. And so how are we going to build programs to improve um, access to care by just looking at social needs? So not just having the care, but how do we get the women to the screening if they have a baby and they need care, for example, or just transportation? So that's also something that we have to do, you know, put into context if our work. The idea of layering these sorts of outreach programs onto our existing anti-poverty programs and other ways that we can get to women, children, and families. Um, but now we have a, a question in our list about how can we raise awareness and promote education on the importance of screening and about early detection. And, and I have to say, and I told you I was going to say this. So, and it's not me who says it first. It's the president, who's my partner, and having lived through this disease now for well over a decade, who says it. Men are either part of the problem or part of the solution. Spoiler: He was part of the solution, not part of the problem. Very much part of the solution. But you know, we can talk about some of the real cancers, the cancer of machismo, the reason why when I say to women. Please, you know, you have to go for a mammogram. You have to go for a breast clinical exam. And they say, no, because I will face abandonment, and I have no way to take care of my children. So the question is, for me, how do we bring men into this context? How do we bring them into helping women get to screening? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. You know, I think about <laughs> being honest, right? We, I think about it often because in the studies that I do, we see the partners coming. And, and listening to what it is that we're saying to their, their wives and their partners, and, and then also being part of making the decision whether or not to participate. And so for, for us, what we do do um, when we do work in the Caribbean is to go on the radio stations where the men are usually the ones who call in and ask questions about breast, self -exam or about breast exams, about cervical cancer, or what that, what that means, what actually is happening in the exam room. And so I guess it's, it's really engaging them and seeing that we're not doing something nefarious um, with their partners because they too care about them and care about us. So you set me up for it. It's not just what's happening in the exam room. It's what's happening in the other room too. Oh. You know, I know many women whose it was their partner, their male partner, who encountered their breast yes, cancer exactly. in a very loving we hope, interaction with that woman. And so the whole idea of being part of the solution is even being part of the process of 
respecting and knowing your partner's bodies. You know, so I think a lot of cancer screening is, or prevention is sometimes caught in gender politics. And this was a lesson that I learned almost 15 years ago working in the Haitian diaspora community where we came to recognize that the incidence of cervical cancer in that particular community was four times higher than anywhere else in Florida and the United States and really rivaled what had been reported for the developing world. And when we worked with community stakeholders to understand why this disparity existed, we came to appreciate that there wasn't any availability of screening. There was no place that at the time a woman could go get a pap smear, which was the gold standard for cervical cancer prevention. But when you spoke to women about their perceptions of pap smear screening, it wasn't just about the lack of access or availability. It was really about concerns regarding the exam and how it may change their sexual desirability for their male partners on whom they were economically dependent. And that becomes really complicated because we often don't consider the complexities that surround cancer prevention and really need to work at multiple levels of effect to achieve the kind of change that we hope to inspire. So there's no question that this is an equity imperative and a health imperative, women's cancers in our region. But I think we're also here for a larger purpose given that we're at Concordia. And that is to talk about how to ensure that women get better access to care overall and that there's gender equity in, um, in the way that we're approaching healthcare in our region throughout the Americas, which is a huge issue. And I mean, for me, one of the points that I think is so important about any of these cancers, I think about it in terms of breast, is that the voice, the advocacy, shouldn't be used just about breast cancer. Right? We should be advocating for better access. We should be advocating for universal health coverage. We should be thinking about catastrophic expenditures that go beyond. Any comments about how cancer can push forward our efforts to improve access to healthcare overall? Yeah, so again, when I think about cancer, I think about the, the entire person in, in the space of prevention. And so beyond cancer screening, we do have you know, just regular health, so diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, and so working really closely with ministries of health and also ministries of education, where we do a lot of health promotion at the school level, are ways that we can maybe capture that population, in particular of women and young kids, um, to be able to, to um, leverage those, those infrastructure. So I think about this a lot. Um, recently, Sylvester was named and the University of Miami, excuse me, was named to be the first collaborating center of the World Health Organization to eliminate cervical cancer. And as part of that initiative, when we talk about making progress on elimination targets, which is often grounded in, in inequitable access, we have to talk about changing systems and structure, space and stuff. And we have to work collaboratively with ministries of health to situate cancer within a broader health context that really requires changing those very fundamental aspects of how healthcare is delivered to enhance the possibility of equity. So I think what we're saying is that through a set of diseases that were historically thought of as a death sentence for women, there's a way to breathe a kind of life into our health systems and make them do better overall for women, but also for men and for all genders. And uh, we're seeing and hoping that the research at the University of Miami and the work of Sylvester and the World Health Organization and other partners can go exactly in that direction. Our thanks to Concordia for making this space for us and to our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.